Thank you. Well, thanks for you for setting this up. I guess it looks like a do your own introduction day. Uh, we, we made it. I'm, I'm so glad that all of you are here, particularly those of you who made the long trip across uh, the former West Street to, uh, to visit this outer line plan for the mechanical engineering empire. I was thanking you, my department head. Thank you for coming. We hope to have, uh, my hope had been to have a few more faculty here to get a chance to share with them some of our latest findings. But uh, it's so nice to have all of the uh, younger minds here and um, to, uh, to share this work with you. So thanks, thanks a lot, everybody. All right, so I guess I don't need to introduce myself since Reed did it so nicely in the uh, uh, in the emails. And so let's get right to it. So we're going to be talking about uh, something kind of special: um, this multi-scale curvature analysis. And uh, I'm going to try to explain to you, I guess, why this is pretty special. Um, most people don't know what surface metrology is, uh, and, and actually, a few years ago, when we got a, a an acknowledgement from the NSF. Um, it said, we've been pleased to receive your proposal on surface meteorology. <laughs> and, and, and then they went ahead and funded it, which sort of tells us something about NSF, but all right. So, uh, so I want to try to explain something about what surface metrology is in case any of you end up at the NSF, and then uh, multi-scale curvature analysis, and then um, what we've done on uh, the uh, uh, scale-specific correlations with uh, to the fatigue one, and uh, I'm going to have a we have a surprise uh, uh, guest lecture. We're gonna, I'm going to tag team with uh, Matt Gleason, who's uh, acknowledged there. And as many people have been involved in this, we'll acknowledge them as we go. All right. So topography. Most of the time, we work with smooth geometries, and uh, we uh, we like it because. Um, we design with planes and spheres and cones and uh, cylinders. And, uh, and if I want to verify that I got what I wanted here, I measure some tens of points, I guess, on the surface. And I'll explain what it's in quotes in a moment. And that's called dimensional metrology. And so we do something like a CMM to see if they go. Professor better. Brown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for coming. So, uh, so what's the difference? In surface metrology, we're interested in the roughness of the surface. And uh, this has to be done statistically. And there's uncertainty. And I'll get around to talking about that later. And instead of using just tens of points like we've used on smooth shapes, uh, we need actually millions of points to specify or to uh, when we measure the surface. And that's surface metrology. Now, actually, if you zoom in on this, if that's an actual part, it will look. It might look something like this. Um, all surfaces seem to have this uh, rough character at finer scales. So, what do I mean by roughness and, and a surface? Well, a surface is a boundary, and so um, it's got to be continuous. It can't be random. Um, in the literature, you'll find people who use random sequences to model rough surfaces, and this is uh, this isn't quite right. The surface is chaotic. And uh, this is something that uh, Mandelbrot uh, uh, developed. Um, and uh, in his uh, recent autobiography, it's nice. It starts off, the title to the introduction is Beauty and Roughness. And, uh, and so uh, I've uh, learned a lot from the things that he has done. But a chaotic surface has got short range correlation. So I, I, uh, if I know that this uh, position is on the surface. The next one can't be anywhere. It's got to be somewhere close to that because it needs to be continuous. But it's not smooth, so it's not differential. So in surface metrology, uh, so we have something that manufactures the surface, and that produces some sort of surface roughness. And at a fine enough scale, every surface has got some kind of chaotic uh, component. And that influences the performance. So this is sort of the, the route from manufacturing to performance. The designer might start with performance, try to figure out what the surface should look like, and then go back to manufacturing. But surface topography is in between, and the surface metrology is the measurement and analysis 
of these surface topographies. And the goal of this measurement and analysis is to try to uh, be able to distinguish surfaces that are good or bad and to find correlations with the manufacturer and the performance. The nature of this, I want to get back to that because that's uh, more of the point today. Um, and uh, it's scale dependent, and, uh, and the scales of interest depend on the application. Um, so if I have a glass, if I have, say, a cup of coffee and put it on this table, the scale of interaction is something like the diameter of the coffee cup and the table is smooth. But when I pour the coffee on the table, now, and I want to see how it's wetting, the table or spreading out. Now it's interacting at a much finer scale, and the table is rough. So as I go to sort of develop the surface metrology, I've got to understand that there are scales of interest. When we go and measure the surface, all right, the, uh, we, uh, we measure at discrete intervals, and we measure over discrete zones. There is no way of measuring the height at a mathematical point. The, the point is infinitesimally small. And so we need to assess the height over some sort of zone, which we call the sampling zone. And then we move over some distance, and we call that the sampling interval. So lots of times you say, well, the height of the point, and that's just an expression, because the height of the point physically doesn't really exist. Um, and so the distance between the sampling zone and, and, and compared to the sampling interval might be many different things. right? So it could be overlapping, could be separate. So here's one of the sort of postulates. It's impossible to know the height of the point, and it's impossible to know all the heights on the surface. So all we can do is measure some heights, and, and actually the, the reason I have this colored is because I'm trying to show inside that sampling zone there's a bunch of different heights. So if I had a different sensor that was a finer sensor, I would get a different kind of height map on that surface. So surface metrology. Start off with some sort of topography, and it could be a replica, right? That, uh, so sometimes if I'm doing roads or something, I have to take a replica of the surface. So I have some sort of measurement device, and then, um, then I need to characterize that measurement. So we measure millions of heights, and as you can see already, I can measure millions of heights, I can get a nice picture, and a picture's worth a thousand words, but I'm an engineer, not a poet. I want some numbers, and some numbers that are gonna correlate with something. So I've got to characterize this, and that's the characterization analysis. And the, and the point here is we want to advance science, support engineering design of processes and products, um, some quality assurance and process control, but all the things that sort of make this a valuable process. So uh, at the root of this, though, is developing characterization parameters that have some power of discrimination so I can tell services apart that perform differently or are made differently and um, are capable of finding correlations. And that's what we're looking at today, an exciting correlation that we just found. Now, when I was studying engineering, people said, oh, surface roughness impacts this and this and this. And I thought once I got into the field, I would find, oh, here's all these relations uh, that, that people discovered that just they didn't put in the textbooks. And I found out they're not there. If you go and look for correlations with surface roughness in the literature, you find very few uh, correlations. We've been fortunate to be able to find some, and that's what we're um, in the system that we've developed, uh, multi-scale analysis, has is, is been important for doing that, and that's one of the things I'm trying to explain today. You always think that when you get into a field and you meet some of the top people in the field, that, uh, oh, so here's all this stuff that I didn't understand before. And the surface metrology was more like, these are the top people in the field? Uh-oh. <laughs> But we, we all sort of felt that way, and we've all been working on developing it, so. All right, so uh, now here's something interesting. On rough or chaotic surfaces, it turns out some of the properties that we like to think are constant, like area, change with a scale of observation. The closer I look, the bigger surfaces. The closer I look, the steeper the slopes are, or the longer lengths are in profiles. The closer I look, the bigger, the more uh, volume there is. But while the, in theory, and mathematically, the area and the lengths um, can increase to infinity, the slopes and the volumes can. And curvature, that's what we're going to talk about here in a moment. But we've done work previously on, on these things. And today, we're going to be looking at curvature. So
So uh, this is an old joke that Vermont would be as big as Texas if you could flatten it out. The idea is that there's areas in the, in the hills. We've tried that, it doesn't actually work, but that's probably the end of the Now historically, uh, people started measuring and trying to do stuff with uh, surface metrology in the 1930s. Um, and, uh, and so it started with height parameters and things like peak to valley. Um, and then the, so here's the RT going from the highest peak to the lowest valley. So you've got a whole bunch of points here. You've got to use some sort of statistical way of, uh, um, of evaluating these. And so uh, take arithmetic average. And this is the most used one. And, uh, and people have high expectations that may be, ah, now I've characterized the surface roughness. I have the RA. And so this is a very limited kind of characterization, although it's widely used. Um, so in just a moment, I'm going to pass this off to Matt. But I want to make a sort I want to show, make you aware of a certain sequence here. So here's some of the height parameters, the classical height parameters for profile. Then if we take the first spatial derivative, so how do the heights change with respect to position? That's obviously the slope. And the second spatial derivative is the curvature. So that's increasing spatial derivative. Uh, so uh, actually now Matt, who has done some of the key work on developing the curvature characterization, is going to fill us in on some of the stuff he's been doing. And then I'll finish with the fatigue. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Um, so, as, so we've, we've done a lot of work on the, at the, the curvature, curvature portion, and the curvature work that we've done has led to the, this fatigue uh, correlation that we, we found. Um, but basically, uh, when, when people start uh, looking at surface, uh, surface characteristics to predict fatigue, currently uh, the parameters they use are RA and RQ, which are also which are called the asterisk arithmetic average and root mean square. Um, this is currently the technique that, that industry uses to correlate surface roughness with, um, with the T. Um, the problem with this is the way it works is that uh, these, basically all these things at the bottom here would be considered, the, would have the same RA um, or RQ. Um, but you could, as you can see from, it, you can clearly see um, the, all these different things would have very different uh, fatigue properties. Something like this would be very, very bad. Something like this wouldn't be so bad at all. Um, and this would be worse than this, but better than this. Um, so we wanted to we wanted to find a better way to correlate surface fatigue. Um, this is just a demonstration of why RA is kind of terrible. Um, RA is very insensitive to fine details. So if you take uh, two different profiles, so you have this one with a very large wavelength and this one with a very small wavelength, and you superimpose them on each other, you get this, uh, this composite uh, right over here. And if you measure the RA for both of them, basically they're the same. Uh, for the red and the green, they're basically the same, even though it has this finer detail um, over here. Um, so this is, this is a problem. I mean, you would expect um, finer details to play play a, a significant role in fatigue. Um, so we need a better way to, to, to do this. So um, one thing we, like Mr. Brown mentioned, is we look at uh, scale. Um, uh, we have a clarification question here. Yep. When you say it, it plays a role in fatigue, mm -hmm. what do you mean? Do you mean that the Crack surface initiation. Of what? Crack initiation. Okay. Um, so so uh, a, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so what you mean is that if the surface has these characteristics, its crack initiation uh, behavior is going to be different. Yes. Um, so if we go back, something like this, cracks, they're very, very sharp points, so cracks would initiate very easily. Meanwhile, uh, if, if you have rounded, rounded points, they're still uh, negative curvatures, positive curvatures. Um, and I'll get more into that in a bit. Um, but this would, because of the rounded edges, the stress is distributed more evenly, so you're probably going to get um, your, the uh, cracks aren't going to start as easily. Um, and these are these are negative curvatures, so it's not really they're 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 up. You're, you're, you'll probably see some problems down here in the corners, but um, it's just just something that. <laughs> um, all right. 
So one thing uh, Professor Brown mentioned that we do in our lab a lot is we look at um, the influence of scale. Um, so when you, when you ask someone to figure out what the curvature of a surface is, you have to basically specify the scale and position where you're looking. Um, and you can get very different results um, depending on where you look and how, how large of an area you look at. Um, so this is just a, an example. If you look at the, if we basically fit a curvature to the red portion, um, the, the, the scale, the distance in the x uh, direction is 12.5 micrometers, and the best fit radius you get from that is about 19.1 micrometers. If you make it so that the red area covers 22.5 micrometers, um, it changes, the radius changes significantly um, when, you, when you go to do the best fit. And then even more so as you make the scale even larger, um, you can see quite a, a, a significant difference at different scales of measurement um, between the, uh, the curvature. So basically, um, what we want to figure out is at what scale um, does crack initiation um, ha play, have a significant influence from curvature. I, I kind of back myself into that one. But, um, So basically the algorithm that we use is based on three points. Um, so we calculate the curvature through three points. Um, so you pick one point, you pick three evenly spaced points, um, and you find the, uh, the, the distances between them. And from that you can basically calculate the area of the triangle. And from that you can calculate the circum radius, the circle that goes through all those three points. Um, we define the, the area, the, the distance in the x direction between the first and the last point as the scale of the measurement. Um, so as we move forward, um, keep that in mind. Um, like I mentioned, the method that we've been using is a geometric method. It's based on Heron's formula. If you get that from the area of the triangle, um, then you calculate the circum radius um, from that. There's actually there's a couple other methods that we've used. We've used a, a, a finite differential method. The problem with that is that doesn't uh, that's not very conducive to changes in scale because um, you, you get a lot of error as the, the points get further apart, further apart, right? Because you're um, you're trying to apply calculus to a non-continuous um, set of points, so it, you're going to get you're going to get errors in there. Um, notably, at very very steep slopes, you're going to get get some mistakes. Um, so so we use that we use that at the smaller at the very very fine scales. Um, that gets used, and then at the larger scales, we use the metric measure. Um, I, I've kind of been using curvature and radius interchangeably, which they are. Um, it's just that curvature is the is the um, the inverse of the radius. Um, and just just to mention, uh, the sign of the curvature based on mathematical convention is that if it's concave up, it's positive, and if it's concave down, it's negative. And the way I remember that is they make happy spaces and smiley faces. Positive people are happy and um, negative people are sad. So, um, so this, is, this is an example of some work that we've done recently. Um, this is actually, this profile right here is of an aspheric lens. It's basically the, the lens that's in all of your cell phones. Um, they make them aspheric like this so that they can correct for chromatic aberration. But basically, um, we, we, we ran this analysis on this um, this profile. And I just want to show you this to get to give you guys an idea of how this works before we show you the big stuff. But um, if you if you have a scale of analysis about this size, you can actually see there's um there's some small dips in curvature over here. You would never notice by just looking at the surface here that there that there are actually flattened points corresponding to around here and over here. Um, but if you use a small enough scale of observation, you can see that. Um, and then as you, as the scale gets bigger, this is what this um, this bar over here is the size of the frame that we, we move across the surface. Um, you can see that uh, the, the red spots over here actually turn into flat curvature, so it, it's an area of constant curvature. And then as you start to get larger, you start noticing the, the larger features. So down over here, this little hill corresponds to a negative curvature as, as it's below, um, below zero, and then uh, positive curvatures over at the edges here. Um, as they're above the, the zero line. Um, point, one thing to note is that at, uh, there are points of, there are inflection points wherever the, 
the code to apply false to zero. Um, so that's useful to know. And this, what we can do with this is we can look at a, as many scales as we possibly can. Um, and we can create this three-dimensional plot. Um, so basically on this axis is scale, on this axis is the precision, and on this axis is the curvature itself. Um, so you can notice at the, for a very large, for this goes, this becomes positive right when this starts to become teal. Um, so you'll notice that at very, very large scales, you're actually seeing the large dip that this is. It's very, it's very, it's positive. And, but when you start to get smaller scales, you start seeing this little bump in the center. So um, to move this forward, um, we, we started applying this to um, turn surfaces. Um, so this is this is a, a turn surface taken and measurement taken from a microscope. Um, and you can you can apply curvature analysis to surfaces as well if you take um, multiple parallel profiles to each other. Um, so we did that something like with this. Um, this is you can only do one profile at a time, um, but it produces a graph that looks something like this. You can see the periodicity of the uh, of the, the turn surface um, with in the curvature plot itself. Um, so you can see the larger features at the larger scales and like the, there are fine regular features at uh, the finer scales. Good. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. All right. So now on to the uh, onto the fatigue part. So this was done in collaboration with the uh, uh, ENS, the Cold Normal Superior de Cachon which is uh, one of the Haute École of France. And so um, we've got Margot Belouz, who was a, a visiting um, sort of scholar here, who did uh, a lot of the calculation work. And um, a couple of professors here, uh, a graduate student is working on his PhD on this too. We actually had two PhDs working on this, uh, this project. And so this sort of team came together. Here's the WPI group. Uh, Steve Cordell, actually, um, in addition, the uh, the WPI team, except for me, are all undergraduate students. Anyway, so here's uh, some measurements. Now they did the measurements, the machining, the fatigue work in uh, in France, and uh, so we can see some of these nicely uh, machined surfaces sort of scooped out here. Let's take a, a look at some more detail. So what we wanted to find was, um, can we find um, correlations between the topography and the fatigue limits and four-point bending. And uh, so we extracted curvatures from those profiles, and as Matt was showing us, they change with position. Now, so basically the state of the art, when we look at uh, stress concentrations, um, we're looking at something like this, where we've got uh, one over the radius and, and you know, calculating a stress concentration. So people have developed models, and this is, I think I sent out paper, the copy of the paper, not to be able to find the references in there. But here's a model based on conventional height parameters with R, A, R, T, R, Z, trying to come up with uh, the uh, geometric stress concentration based on roughness measurements. So this is not scale sensitive, and as Matt was showing you, um, you know, there's some limited stuff there. So uh, here's the material. Um, it's a Benedict steel, and there's the, the strengths and the hardness. And it was annealed after rolling. And some of these were stress relieved after machining. You can see some of the microstructure there. The machining was done by ball and milling. Um, and so here's the machining conditions. And, uh, and so what they did was they inclined the ball in mill to the surface. So here it's shown at about minus 45 degrees. So there's two different inclinations that were going on. And then uh, sometimes relative to the fatigue stress would be transverse or longitudinal. And, uh, and then Let's see, and then they, some were stress relieved and some weren't. So, uh, so there are altogether six different parts that were uh, that they determined the fatigue limits on. Um, and, and I'll get back to that in just a minute. So it was measured with this uh, a still micro station, which is a French instrument. Um, it's a horizontal profiling instrument, and the uh, sampling interval was 625 nanometers. So it uses a laser. Um, confocal chromatic height sensor. Uh, the measurements were all uh, cropped to uh, 707 micrometer region and then a uh, modal outlier filter which comes from ANSI, uh, University of Savoie in France, 
as you said, and, and the, the basis of this actually was started, or some of the basis of this was started when one of these guys was a visiting scholar here from the uh, University of South Carolina. Um, so this is something about the filtering, the special modal outlier filter. The, the interesting aspect of this, whenever you do these optical measurements, you get some outliers, or, or very often you do. And those will, of course, influence your ability to calculate the, the parameters of the, the geometry. So you need to get rid of the um, doubtful measurements. And, uh, and this is a particularly robust way of doing it. Other filters um, go after high frequencies, and then you'll lose the high frequency information the good parts of the signal as well. So here's t uh, renderings of two measurements. And uh, so shown here, here's the uh, 45 degrees, and there's the minus 3. So you can get an idea of the range of topographies that were uh, created by the machine. And so in some cases, these are stressed uh, transverse, and in some cases, longitudinal So um, the fatigue tests were done in four-point bending. There were about 80 fatigue specimens that were used to establish the fatigue limits for the six different cases. And so here are the fatigue limits. Um, and the, just the polished surface has a higher fatigue limit than these. So there's a nice range of fatigue limits. So using the method that, uh, uh, that Matt just showed us, here's a profile, and then at a scale of 150, here's the curvatures that you see from that profile. So you can see in the middle, you have the positive curvatures, here's some peaks from the negative curvatures. At a finer scale, we're just seeing the positive curvatures in the middle. And so these are all two of the different specimens, and you can see that there's some variation there. So this uh, 3D characterization of scale, position, and curvature. So here's comparing those, those two uh, that we just saw, again, the 45 and the minus 3. Uh, and you'll notice we've truncated this, and I think we flipped it around for a match up. So here's the fine scale right here, so you can see it better and then the, uh, the coarser scales. Now, of course, the reason why this narrows is that the longer the scale is that you have to consider to uh, get the uh, curvature, the less of the profile you can cover as the profile is finer. Um, and so here's the, uh, with a different vertical axis, so you can see it, and you can see the variation of the curvature um, at, the, at the finest scale, and some of these little patterns on there. So now the problem, though, gets to be we have a bunch of curvatures, um, and they're changing with position. And so we're back to kind of the same problem. We have the heights. We measure a profile, we've got a bunch of heights. Which one do we take? So we need to do some sort of statistics on it. So historically, on the heights, we've done average, you know, RA, arithmetic average, root mean square, um, you know, peak to valley. So when Margot came here for her uh, stage, uh, she started looking at sort of different combinations that would seem logical. So one of the things that we've been doing here the last 25 years at WPI with surface metrology is that instead of saying, well, which 1930s parameter should we try on this one? Oh, RA, that's what everybody else is using. We said, what would we really like to know about the surface in order to um, understand the way it's behaving and uh, to make functional correlations? So curvature is an obvious thing here. And so we tried a number of different combinations of things. Should we get curvatures at the bottom of the valleys? Should we see where they line up to make sure it's not just one isolated curvature, but there's something there? So Margot went through an amazing number of things. And here's some of the best ones. And, uh, and, and until very near the end, this was, what we, this was the best we had. So we'll just use the, the maximum curvature. Now, on each of these measurements, she looked at uh, 1,120 profiles from each measurement. So, all right, we'll just take the, the maximum. And, uh, and so I said, all right, R squared 0.76. That means three quarters of the variation in uh, fatigue strain or fatigue limit you can explain with that parameter. So that's pretty good. I think nobody's done, uh, on, on, uh, done much better than that. And then uh, right near the end, I said, how is it going? She goes, oh, well, I got another one that's looking pretty good. And I said, you should have called me in the middle of the night, 0.96. That's amazing. Uh, um, and uh, so that was, this is a very exciting result. 
So you take the, the uh, maximum of all the means of those and add uh, two standard deviations. And that was the combination that did this. And intuitively, this makes a little bit of sense because it's the worst one that's going to get you. So, uh, and, and so we had tried just the worst one, too, and that didn't, that didn't work very well. So uh, in the end, we get, uh, here's the correlation. So uh, these two were stress relieved. So the, uh, the stress, uh, relieving the residual stresses from the machining doesn't seem to have much of an impact on this. And here's this criteria from the, uh, the maximum of the average uh, curvatures plus two standard deviations. And there's the fatigue line. And so that's the R squared of 0.96 that we're seeing. So very strong correlation. Uh, one of the interesting things is that's right at uh, 610 micrometers. So that's where we're getting the strong correlation. So this is a plot that we started doing some years ago when we first found correlations with adhesive strength in relative area. And, and so what we're looking at is how does the regression coefficient change the scale? So here are the very fine scales. Um, so we're getting no correlation. Um, and then the interesting thing is it bounces up somewhat regularly, although not the top, uh, uh, monotonously. Um, but it's, it's got a, a smooth kind of aspect to it until you know, we're hitting, the, there's the 0.96 at 610 micrograms. So that's for this material, this, uh, you know, in you know, four-point bending. So we're not saying that 610 is going to work for everything, uh, but uh, uh, what, we, uh, what we have is a procedure for finding that scale for uh, a specific case. So, uh, so there we are, the maximum plus two standard deviations. The strength of the correlation uh, is, uh, varies with the scale. Um, and we filed here with WPI a provisional patent on this procedure, this method for determining the, uh, uh, the, the curvature and the scale of the curvature for, um, uh, for fatigue. So this, this could be important and we're hoping that so people that make aircraft or fatigue critical structures will be interested in this. So I'd like to go back to some general things on surface metrology uh, to finish up. So one of the uh, analogies that I'd like to use for emphasizing why scale sensitivity is important, because as we saw from Matt's demonstration, the RA is not scale sensitive. I can add fine scale details that change the RA. So in most of the parameters that we use are like that. So. Uh, so the scale sensitivity is like turning the radio. If I listen to the whole band at once, I can't make any sense out of what's going on. But if I tune into some station, then I can make some sense of what's going on. And that's essentially what we're doing with the multi-scale analysis. So, uh, so we need to limit the, the bandwidth, the, you know, the width of the frequencies we're looking at appropriately. And that's what we're doing. Yeah, Chris? Yeah. Can you go back to that picture? There's probably four of us in here who know what you're looking at. Comment. <laughs> 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 How many people know what we're looking at? <laughs> How many people have ever seen a radio dial before? <laughs> Everybody's not going to guess. Okay. <laughs> it's an old radio dial. Yeah, right? but, uh, I, I just went on the web to see what I could oh, find. Oh, no, it's a great radio dial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe I, I should get something else. Sure. I don't have one in my house right now. So this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, maybe they watch old movies. Yeah. Or <laughs> the Humphrey Bogart. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so uh, what sort of questions should we be asking as engineers? So how do we specify a surface? How do we get from functional to physical? In other words, we want something say with a good fatigue life, we need to spec that physically. And then how do we go from physical to process? How do we manufacture the surface that's going to have the physical aspects that we want? And so what we need is a kind of trimodal thinking where we can go from functional to physical to process. Now, we should be able to do this with all kinds of sort of tolerancing uh, on, uh, uh, on all kinds of parts, not just surface metrology. 
and this is something that we ought to be doing a better job of in general. So here's another question that I'd like to, uh, um, uh, to leave you with. Uh, is surface metrology a scientific discipline? So um, a scientific discipline is one where we have a few underlying uh, self-consistent principles that we can apply to solving a wide range of problems. So this is one of the things that sort of Newton developed. Here's some laws of mechanics. And then we got you know, thermo and electricity and magnetism. And, and then Namsu applied this to design. Uh, so what about surface metrology? I think up until now, it's pretty much been a, just a set of methods, standards, closely associated facts. I mean, look at any of your manufacturing textbooks and materials textbooks. It's just, oh, if you're doing this, use this parameter. And doing this, use this parameter. And it looks about like the guide to diet in the health food stores. Eat beets and it'll be good for your brain. Yeah. Where's the experimental evidence on this? Right? How, do they, how do they possibly do this? And so it's the same thing with the, uh, what we're seeing in, the, uh, in surface metrology. So can we find some rules that are going to, uh, we can use to apply how things influence surface topography, so from the manufacturing side, but not just manufacturing, because there's use where um, and there's, uh, which covers all kinds of things, like forensics and anthropology, archaeology, and we've worked with uh, anthropo anthropologists and archaeologists as well. So, um, and then how do uh, the topographies influence things? So, things like flow, adhesion, cleanability, friction, fatigue. So, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Hamburg for the fourth International Conference on Surface Metrology, which is kind of significant because we had the first two here at WPI. It was a conference we started right here. And the third was in Annecy in France, uh, fourth in Hamburg, and the fifth will be in Pozon in Poland in two years. So uh, it's nice to see that thing that we initiated here continuing. And the idea is that we get people of all disciplines that are practicing surface metrology anthropologists, archaeologists, art conservationists, engineers of all types. And, and, so, um, and so this was the, the first time I really started thinking about this. I had a, a, a keynote and a tutorial to give there. So somehow this question popped into my mind. I don't know why it's taken 25 years for me to ask this question myself and propose this, but here's what I was coming up with. So one, we want to characterize Things that the appropriate geomet or the uh, get the appropriate geometrical aspect or nature of the surface is it slope area curvature looks like for friction actually slope works a lot and for fatigue we'd expect curvature some of the contact mechanics have been always modeled with curvatures which should make sense area seems good for adhesion area and slope are highly related um, and then uh, we need to do it at the right scale and that was this uh, obscure reference to uh, entertainment. 20th century that I just showed everybody. Sound coming right through the air. All right, at certain frequencies. <laughs> um, and then uh, the other thing is, I need a good enough measurement. And so I need to make sure that my measurement includes the appropriate scales. I mean, one of the reasons why we haven't found more correlations in the literature is that uh, historically measurements haven't been made at the appropriate scales. The characterization hasn't been done at the appropriate scales, and people haven't correlated or uh, ca calculated the appropriate kind of you know, geometrical feature. I guess it might be about an aspect. But, uh, so here's another question. When we model machine surfaces and look at the roughness, we actually model it smooth. We say, all right, here's what the tooltip does on the, on the surface. And we end up with a bunch of smooth cusps. And actually, if you read the paper I sent you, there's also the smooth estimation, or the, you know, this cusp es estimation of the roughness on the surface. But there's something special about smooth versus rough. And if it's smooth, I know unambiguously where all the points are. If I say this is smooth, here's a plane, here's three points that aren't linear, of course. Then I can tell you unambiguously where every other point is on that plane. If I say, now it's rough, we can't tell with certainty where the rest of the points are. Um, so what we need to do is have some idea of you know, 
I certainly are. So it's not just a plane. If it's a nice smooth curve, we can say unambiguously where the, the next point is. And so the interval here, I, is representing the scale. But if it's rough, we might approximate it and say, well, I designed it to be a cylinder. But of course, the guys in the shop can't make it to be a cylinder. I asked for it. I asked for it to be exactly this long, and they didn't do it. Um, and so we have tolerances on things, right? And so, so now if I want to know where the point is in the middle, or the height is in the middle, I'm not so sure, or any of these, right, because it varies. So uh, for a long time, I've been talking about sort of fractal surfaces and Euclidean. And then uh, a nice physicist, uh, Lars Bach from uh, Olmsted University in Sweden, pointed out that you know, Euclidean geometry isn't just about smooth. It's you get you know certain things that actually don't work on some smooth things, so it's not just smooth. And I said, what should I use? He said, entropy, and then walked away. <laughs> and then so I said, huh, oh, I'll give you something to think about. So uh, I, I classical sort of thermodynamics was uh, something that uh, I, I think I would still struggle with, but I like statistical. Uh, and I like Boltzmann's equation. So this kind of made sense to me. How many different possible states are there? And so how does this sort of map onto topography? And uh, so what this W then, which is the number of possible states for Boltzmann, might map into sort of the uncertainty in locating some of the midpoints. So I just sort of wrote this down intuitively. And I fussed around with the different ways of representing it with the curvature. But I think if we take a look at the uh, standard deviation of the heights, which is really RMS, but this is what we use for representing uncertainty and all kinds of things in engineering uh, when we're looking at lengths and measurements. So in the case of a smooth surface, unambiguously I can state where this, uh, uh, that the height of that location would be. And so now I've got an entropy of zero. And, and the I, the sub I here indicates that this changes the scale, it changes the interval. So if I'm <laughs> dealing with the table and I've got the, the roughness is very small um, compared to the size of the table, and that's my scale of interest, then the entropy is zero and I don't have to, or very close to zero, I don't have to worry about it. But if I'm looking at a scale like this where I'm getting this kind of variation, then I'm going to have uh, a larger standard deviation. And, uh, and so intuitively that seems to work. And Maybe I should put a proportion sign there because I'm not sure what sort of constant we're looking at. Um, but it's sort of, we have this idea of uh, lost energy and entropy, so it's lost smoothness and topographic entropy. Anyway, um, so I wanted to acknowledge uh, Olympus, who's been a great supporter of the lab. They've given us this Lex uh, OLS 4000 to use, and they've replaced it once. And, uh, Actually, as soon as they sell this one, they tell me they'll give us another new one. Digital Surf makes software in uh, Besançon in France, and they've been very generous, and they let us use it for the class. It's very expensive software, very good. And one day, they'll integrate our analysis into it. And uh, so for the uh, scale, uh, the multi-scale analysis, the length area filling, we've developed this here at WPI, again with undergraduate students doing a lot of the work. So thank you for your attention. And as I point out when I uh, give this talk, I said this is the oldest, or I give talks in other places, this is the oldest building continuously used for engineering education in the United States. And we have our service metrology lab in there. And I, one day I was following uh, Jay Raja from UC, uh, UNC Charlotte where they've got uh, their surface metrology lab um, on a uh, concrete slab, isolated from the bedrock, but on the bedrock, um, and they control the temperature to plus or minus 100 of a degree. Ah, and a good day in this building, we can control the temperature to plus or minus three or four degrees. And, um, and we're on the second floor of this oldest you know, building. So if we find a relationship in this building, it is robust. You can <laughs> count on it. It doesn't depend on any prissy temperature control. It's going to work where you are, too. All right, thanks.